I, I'm so delighted to see uh, all of those names uh, finally on this movie, including your father's. Uh, although we should note that even though his name was not on the movie uh, when it showed in American theaters, uh, it was widely known that he did this. And in fact, um, after five missions, um, he was he was grounded uh, basically on orders from the army because he was the most uh, prominent American Jewish director who who had suspended his career in Hollywood to do this service. And, and it was really felt that if, if the Germans knew that William Wyler was in a plane, uh, he would make a very tempting uh, target for, for capture or killing. He was actually grounded after four missions, right. but he pretended he hadn't gotten the telegram and went on the fifth mission. Uh, yes, and, and then and he was seriously grounded. And when he won his Academy Award for Mrs. Miniver, um, I believe uh, reference was made to, to the mission over Wilhelmshaven. That's right. My mother accepted the Oscar for him and said that he would it would probably please him about as much as that flight over Wilhelmshaven <laughs> did. <laughs> And he didn't find out until uh, a Stars and Stripes reporter told him, I think, that he had won the Academy Award. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, uh, I want to talk about both the movie and the restoration, but I want to start by asking you about your own particularly long relationship with this work of your father's. You, you've had a long history with, with Memphis Bell, and, and what was, do you remember when the first time you saw it and it really registered for you was? I don't remember when I first saw it. I do remember uh, dinner tables of my childhood with some of the crew members, Vince Evans in particular, and some of the other people around. Uh, there was a, another pilot named Burn Lay. You could see his name on one of the planes in the briefing, uh, who was the person who was supposed to run interference between my father and the the bureaucracy knew what he was right. doing they he became a screenwriter and a friend and i remember as a child being very aware of when these guys would get together and it's true that they didn't talk about it outside of their reunions pretty much but uh, uh when they were together at our house uh you really got a sense of the emotional content of their experience. And I think your father was, uh, what, 40 or 41? He when was he 40, and uh, he had. I was born, and my sister was on the way, and he had a very hard time getting himself into the Army Air Force. But he finally found, the way he told the story, he finally found a general who uh, he convinced would be kind of cool to have a guy with a camera following him around. And <laughs> that's, that's right. how he finally got in. And he was amazed to find that uh, they made him a major right away. Right, right. And he was also urged by a lot of his uh, colleagues while he was in England waiting to get this assignment to do the movie. that Because this, this particular format, this movie was his idea completely. He, he wanted to... He proposed two things, making a movie about the 10-man crew of, of one of these uh, one of these planes and and making a movie about the 25th mission. And then he sort of merged those ideas. But many people uh, in the sort of uh, morale and movie-making division of, of the Army and the Air Force urged him to do reenactments and restagings instead of getting the, you know, getting the footage the hard way, which he certainly did. Mm -hmm. um, we should note that uh, the the three other credited uh, filmers, um, uh, Harold Tenenbaum was, was killed in action uh, while making this movie, and also, I think, uh, Bill, Bill Clothier and uh, William Skull. Uh, some of their footage is, is oh, in this sure. as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, if you haven't seen the Memphis Bell until now, I can't emphasize to you what an incredible transformation this is uh, as a restoration. It, it really is like seeing it for the first time in terms of everything from the color to the 
steadiness of the image to the clarity of the faces uh it's it's a much more emotional experience even than it was before and it i think has always been the most emotional most human most humane of all of those movies made during the war um uh, you know it, it it's astounding to me how uh how much more powerful it is than when i ever saw it before and uh it and also i think as you as you said in in your introduction there there are moments that my father may never have seen in 16 or 35 mil that the 4k brings out well there's a sequence there's one shot that i didn't i actually had to wait to see it on a big screen during the damage sequence where you see a uh, plexiglass nose of a B-17 and there's blood spray, arterial blood spray, like a Windex bottle. And I'm pretty sure that they wouldn't have let that in in the original version, but it had been stepped on. But when, when I spotted that, I, I literally jumped out of my seat say, oh my God. And I'm sure Wilder's cameraman shot it, not because he thought it'd get in the movie, just wow, look at that. So things pop out in the film. Every time I see it, I see little details that you didn't see before. We should note that there were a lot of fights over the content of this movie. There, uh, Some narration was originally written for the end that was quite melancholy, uh, talking about uh, a victory party at which the pilots couldn't really immerse themselves uh, in celebration because they were thinking about the, the comrades that they had lost. Um, and uh, that your father really had to thread the needle in terms of making a movie that would boost morale while staying true to his own real desire to give it to you as it was. Well, he includes that shot where the guy glares at the camera, you know, which is a great moment where he said some people don't like to be filmed. He breaks the fourth wall, which is not something you would see in a 1943 propaganda film. You know, that's a right. bold to comment on the filmmaking. Very, yes. You know, and there's little things, there's subtleties in there. And there's a narrator that I'm fond of pointing to Catherine. There's a point where the censor narrator does a patch in the middle of the film and in mid-sentence the real narrator comes back and it's there. And every time, you know, there's, again though, you really have to kind of watch it closely to see that sort of, the, that one seam showing. Um, I just have one practical question, which is uh, how how are people not at the festival going to be able to see this um, uh, particular restoration? Good question. I mean, um, question. the Cold Blue, which we screened before, which is the answer record to this, if you will, it's you know Memphis Bell 2.0, um, uh, is HBO, bless their hearts, is is has taken on board, and they're going to do a fabulous job putting it out in time for the 75th anniversary of 1944 next year, probably in the summer. And the Memphis Bell is uh, circling. We're firing red flares right now to try to get... Um, uh, At the moment, it's having a lot of interest from film festivals, especially since right. it has the... They want to play together. You know, it's important because the Cold Blue complements this and this complements that. And it, right. it, you could do dissertations on 1943 versus 2018 filmmaking and obviously moral dimensions of America, which we won't get into right now and in this venue. But, you know, there's, it, there's a lot of, it's provocative to have these two things play together. And, and your father stayed close to the, the, the particular crew of the Memphis Bell um, for, for many decades afterwards, didn't he? That's right. That, he did. That's, as I say, some of them would uh, come to the house for dinner periodically. Right, and there'd be reunions occasionally, and I know there's correspondence that you know, he sort of kept up and learned what was happening with their families. As oh, they... and by the way, when, he, when he, they came on the war bond tour and he brought them back to Hollywood to do their voiceovers, oh, yes. he also asked each one of them, which mo would movie star would he most like to meet? And had a big party with all of the movie stars that they wanted to see. <laughs> and this tour, by the way, there's a film in this tour, because these guys were, let's just say, uh, t t testosterone-charged guys who were plucked off the front lines and did an all-expenses flying tour to every single air base and war factory in the country. And let's just say the Memphis Bell divorce ended the relationship three months into the tour when she called the hotel room and a woman answered the phone for pa Pilot Morgan. <laughs> and these guys, and so by the time they hit Hollywood and 
they asked her dad, hey, any Hollywood stars? They were, they had a good time. We found footage, which I'll, I'll dwell on, but them in Vegas, in Jeeps. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's not Corleone Vegas. This is shack Jeeps and dirt road Vegas. It's amazing footage, and I'm thinking, man, these guys. And then Robert Morgan re-enlists and goes back and flies B-29s over Japan. Both Morgan and Varinus. Think flew about that. Robert Morgan was the captain. Yeah, so, they flew 25 more missions. Yeah, so the thing is, you survive this, you go to this, and then you re enlist and you fly over the Pacific where B 29 crews were routinely vivisected by the Japanese when they landed. I mean, a wholly different kind of thing. And these guys volunteer from it. And you have to ask yourself, you know, it's a very complex question, you know. and getting back to the question about the future of the Mem this restoration of the Memphis Bell, it's important to have it out there because it makes this conversation possible. Sort of a dialogue between 1943 America and the present day. And, you know, it contains multitudes. Well, you've given me a thought, actually. Uh, my father said that at the time, Roosevelt said that it, the film had to screen in every theater in the country. Perhaps our president. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, FDR wants everyone to see it. So, you know, we got to well, go with. You're going to have to put it on Fox if you want this one to see it. Yeah. Um, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, yes, in the back. You know, uh, th I so that was a question about, for those who didn't hear, the production uh, of, of the movie, although production is a sort of strange word because it was, it was a wartime assignment. He, he went to England, he had a crew of two other people from Hollywood who, who came over as, as uh, potential cinematographers, as, as, as Weiler was, uh, and then picked up a third one uh, along the way. And, and the ship with the equipment was sunk in a convoy. He had to pick up equipment once in the UK. And then they filmed for about three months, principal photography, brought it back, and then did transfers in England, brought the footage back, and then it went through some variations and came out in the spring of 44. So it was a pretty quick production thing, but he was juggling Thunderbolt too, wasn't he, getting ready for that? So he was a busy guy. Yeah. Oh, well, and also the answer is they didn't know that they had enough, that they had nailed it. He, he couldn't fly anymore. Um, I, I mean, they said, stop. Well, the tragedy you know. of it, and we fixed it, is that when he was looking at the footage in the lab in London, they've risked their life for it, the thing, the look at the footage machine, filmmakers, and tell me what that is, scratch the negatives. So in every print of the Memphis Bell, if you ever want to watch it for fun, go home and go to YouTube to look at the Memphis Bell. You'll see these hideous blue scratches through all this footage. And we took every scratch out. We, we digitally removed them all that, you know, and I, there was some heat from some purists saying, but the Memphis Bell, the scratches are integral to the film. <laughs> And I called Catherine and I said, you know what, I'm not taking that fucking note. You know, we're taking, you know, what would your dad say? And we took him out. Yeah. Let's have another question. Um, uh, yes, way in the back. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's I you. One of my favorite movies, one of my favorite movies, uh, and probably a lot of people in this room, is the, uh, Weiler's Best Years of Our Lives. And watching this film, it really resonates so much with that film uh, as a companion piece. And I was curious uh, if, if indeed uh, the making of the Memphis Bell inspired the making of the best years of our lives. Oh, I'm sure it did. Uh, my father always said that um, the making of best years was one film that he didn't have to do any research on because he'd been there and uh, he came back deaf uh, from the flying and so he, uh, you know, he'd, he'd been there and, and knew what it was like. He do, there's a shot in them, you know, the famous shot where they see each other for the first time after being overseen, which is a direct lift from your dad seeing uh, your mom for the first time in one hotel in New York. That's, you know, that's exactly right. The, yeah, they key. ran to each other in the so, hotel. And he, because he was hanging out with these guys, he knew when they were coming home how wrecked they were. So 
it's true. It, 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 the, Me the best years of our lives is absolutely part two of the Memphis Bell. If you want to know more about that, I'll point you toward a really good book. Um, <laughs> uh, and a really good television series. <laughs> That's right. Um, but yes, um, uh, William Wyler said at one point that he was all three of the main characters uh, who come home in the best years of our lives. Um, well, it's funny. It's, I'm apropos, but it's a nice moment. You've just seen the movie. There's a scene where, great scenes where you see the landing gear coming down and the landing gear coming up. One thing your dad was told was under no circumstances is anyone allowed in the ball turret down below the plane during takeoff and landing for obvious reasons if something happens. So a certain major took it upon himself to do the shot himself both ways. So those shots and his attitude was when they get, a, you know, what are they going to do? But that's, <laughs> you know, what I, I got. I mean, you, you, you get it now from... Um, seeing the movie but the the degree to which he put himself in harm's way and at great risk cannot be overstated and even sort of rattled initially the young members of the crew of the memphis bell who who said who who's this man who's telling us to fly closer to the flak so that he can get the shot um so uh does anyone else have a question uh yes Catherine, maybe people don't know that you made your own movie called The Memphis Bell. Can you talk a little bit about that movie and, and how that uh, related to this original version? Well, actually, it's, it's, uh, it wasn't my idea. Uh, I was at Columbia Pictures with uh, David Putnam, who was a great producer and was a CEO of Columbia Pictures for a while, and he asked to see the documentary that I'd made about my father for uh, PBS American Masters. And uh, I showed him the documentary. There was a, a piece about the Memphis Bell. And he said, well, maybe we should look at the Memphis Bell. And it turned out he'd been looking for a World War II story. So uh, we fictionalized the backstory of the guys and uh, made a film that came out in 1990. And it was a pretty great experience, I Matthew Modine. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but uh, thank you all so much for coming, and uh, spread you, the word about this wonderful restoration. <laughs> <laughs>